Hi, I'm Greg Weldon. I'm the CEO of Weldon Financial. We publish Weldon Live, a daily global macro market research product. And we were just introducing gold-guru.com to uh, really kind of hone in and take advantage of the opportunities coming up here in the precious metals markets. Sure, in terms of what's going on in Europe, I mean, it really is the place to start because this is the next point of attack in terms of central banks uh, potentially having to wield their monetary weapons to fight a wave of dis, if not deflation. And in the case of Europe, I mean, wow, the central bank has really painted themselves in a the corner there. Super Mario, I mean, his, his legacy is almost at risk here in the sense that they had an opportunity back in the beginning of 2018, the first quarter of 2018, to actually do what the Fed did, uh, raise rates, Re, you know, kind of, you know, re, restock the monetary ammunition, as it were, in terms of conventional tools, i.e. rate cuts, that they could use on the back end when the next problem began to, to, to hit. And uh, the Fed was very adept at doing this. They did a brilliant job. They very much articulated exactly what they were doing and did it. And they're in a much better position now, which just magnifies the situation that the ECB finds themselves in, where now GDP in Germany has gone from being positive and positive on a real basis, even with relatively high and rising inflation, you still had real GDP rising and pretty fat. Um, that's not the case at all now. You have uh, nominal GDP actually approaching and potentially being negative. You have a potential recession in the Eurozone. This would feed off of Germany, just like you had strength in places like Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, even in Spain, which was a juggernaut a year and a half ago economically. Uh, you don't have that now, and you have the potential backfiring out of the German situation. It could be real negative. You look at PMIs. I know that Raul has been all over this with some really good stuff lately, too, about how the projections of some of the forward-looking indicators in Germany, the uh, PMIs, the ZEW, the IFO Institute, the, e the EU Commission, was a particularly interesting report two weeks ago with all kinds of really you know, micro data that suggests the economy over there is in deep trouble. And the projections would be something like a two to maybe as much as 3% decline in uh, German GDP, which means the periphery is probably going to be worse. And what is the ECB going to do? They're going to cut rates another 20 basis points, which is what's priced into the deposit rate futures market. They take it to minus 60. It's kind of like, who cares? They do more QE. Who cares? And to the degree that more and more bond yields, the 10-year in more countries being negative nominally, essentially you're paying governments to hold your money. You're sucking huge amounts of capital out of the uh, underlying economy, out of the kind of really essentially almost out of the banking system. And that doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't behoove the thought process around, you know, we're regaining some growth traction and, uh, you know, gosh forbid we actually achieve inflation targets. So the ECB is really going to be under the gun here. And there's some talk about some pretty interesting things that they might do, which would be QE on steroids. And that's where you start to come into focus with some kind of bigger picture that revolves around gold. Well, when it comes to Deutsche Bank and all the banks in Europe and, you know, I mean, if the, if the ECB cuts another 20 basis points, which is fully priced in now and you get to minus 60 on the overnight deposit rate, again, it's a giant who cares. It really is more about what's the next step. What is the step that can basically kind of, you know, repair the damage done by the fact that they didn't raise rates to give themselves some room? Not only that, but if you look at what happened in the U.S., the Fed raises rates and all of a sudden banks are going to have margins again. You're going to stimulate lending and, uh, you know, the bank shares rally. You didn't see that in, in Europe. Bank shares are largely at their lows, if not making new lows. Relative to the broader markets there, they're at multi-decade, if not all-time lows. The thought process being discussed, from what I understand through channels, you know, and kind of behind the scenes, is pretty interesting. And I'll throw it at you, and you know, we'll see what happens. Because to me, this makes a lot of sense. Not that it's the right move. The time for the right moves, 1990 was the last time you could have maybe applied some kind of fix to all this. Now it's one thing and one thing only, pain avoidance. The deepest pain, a debt deflation. Europe potentially staring down the barrel of that gun right now. So what do they do? Well, what if they were to actually raise interest rates? Oh my God, you get, say, a 100, a 200 basis point deposit rate. 
Now all of a sudden, fixed income is fixed income again. You're paying investors, you're paying depositors to put money in the bank. And on the flip side, the ECB, using the LTRO program, is able to establish a borrowing rate for banks that say minus 100 or minus 200. Say you had a symmetrical minus 200, plus 200, two-tiered system. You know, a deposit rate against a borrowing rate for banks. Now, the thought process goes so far as to suggest what would happen is that this would facilitate banks making loans to consumers and businesses at minus 50 basis points. Essentially, paying consumers, paying businesses to borrow more money. I mean, negative interest rates, the thought process was that's going to be a, you know, a penalty dynamic that will force consumers to go out and spend money. It's not how it's happened. It's sucked money out of the system. So in this case, this kind of setup, while dramatic, while QE on steroids, would have some desired impact if your desired impact is to kind of push for a reflation. But at the same time, and, you know, on the back end of that, you might get some severe reversals in some of the markets like the deposit rate futures, which are pricing in rate cuts. If you hike rates, you're going to have a massive opportunity to be short those contracts. Something like the bonds would probably get hit too. Yields would start to rise. The flip side would be stock markets would probably love this idea. You know, at least for some time period, it would be a honeymoon for, for the stock markets. And really, when you come back down to it, this might be the most bullish thing I've heard potentially if it were to ever come to fruition, the most bullish thing for gold that I've, I've heard in 35 years of doing this. Against that backdrop, the view on gold is very positive and it's even positive to the degree that the last six to nine months haven't been negative. Because if you look at the dollar and the dollar's trading, you know, 98 and a half, the dollar is bidding to kind of break out here in a short-term basis and get back to the highs from 2016 closer to 104 on the dollar index. The trade-weighted dollar index has been even stronger. And against that backdrop, gold has not cracked. If you overlay these things, gold would be trading more along the lines of 1100, maybe as low as 1050, given where the dollar is. That delinkage is huge, because what it tells you is if the dollar is the strongest currency out there, and gold is appreciating in dollar terms, that means gold is appreciating against all paper currencies, that's the sweet spot for gold. That's what you have right now. In fact, the gold adjusted value of the dollar index, simply the dollar divided by gold, really not rocket science, is on the verge of a major breakdown into what has already been a secular breakdown. So it would be a fresh leg down here, which would mean, you know, obviously gold's already broken out above this 1375 level. That was key resistance. And if you lay out the technical structure on a long-term basis, even going back to 1971, when Nixon delinked gold you know, from the dollar officially. Uh, this has kind of been a four-wave setup, all right? Wave one, two, wave three was into the, to the uh, 2011 high. The most recent correction to the lows around 1050, lo and behold, it's almost a perfect 50% retracement of the entire bull move from 1971 to the 2011 high. And I remember specifically, you know, just watching this very closely back when gold was under pressure into, you know, late 2014 and into the 2015 low. The number of days that you got below that 50% retracement and then closed back above it, the number of kind of tailed reversals like on a candlestick chart that you might see below this 50% retracement level just belied so much demand there. It was uncanny to watch the math and to watch how it played out you know, in the manifestations of the market movements to where it held that level. More recently, there was some questions around gold. You know, was maybe gonna break 1260 again and could have had a real another significant 100, 150, $200 decline, and it didn't do that. So when you throw all this into the mix, let alone you take places like Angola, Pakistan, Colombia, Uruguay, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, I mean, Gold in these currencies, record highs in almost every case. So a lengthening list of currencies against which gold is at record highs, including the Aussie dollar, for example, including you know, some major currencies. Swiss, uh, Swedish krona would be another example. And then you look at the, you know, the, the dynamic around how the dollar is playing out in this context. Again, you, know, you kind of go back to if the ECB is going to pull some you know, QE on steroids rabbit out of a hat here, 
Okay, wouldn't it make sense that gold is kind of appreciating in all paper currencies? Because essentially what you really have going on here at the end of the day, the most base case at the instinctive level is a growing uncertainty, fear, and even mistrust around all paper. They're just going to keep printing more and more paper every time there's an issue around disinflation, deflation. Well, you know, at some point there is a level of uncertainty and anxiety around all that paper. And it is IOUs, currencies, sovereign debt. It's all the same. It's an IOU. And, you know, it's kind of cliche, but it is powerful and it's true. The dynamic around gold being kind of an offset to all of this paper that they just keep printing. In terms of the Fed and, you know, kind of did they go too far, number one, and are they behind the curve now, number two? I mean, they are very valid questions. And the answer is yes and yes. Uh, but the answer also depends on who you listen to, okay? Because I wrote the piece going all the way back into August. It was called Take Me Out to the Ball Game. It was about the Fed. It was about Jackson, uh, uh, Jackson Hole. It was about Jerome Powell. He is not Bernanke. He is not Yellen. They were students of the deflation era of the 1920s. They know how to fight a debt deflation. Jerome Powell told us, I'm not that. I am a student of the 1970s inflation. He was very specific on this, giving examples from when he was younger, too, even, in terms of what was happening then with Carter. And, of course, we had the gasoline crisis, the OPEC crisis, the, the Middle East crisis fed into that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it took Paul Volcker and 16% short-term interest rates to ratchet out inflation. And he, he just basically threw the gauntlet down and said, I will not let that happen on my watch. If that's not a tell that this guy's going to take it a step too far, I don't know what was. It was a beautiful tell. He told us exactly what he was going to do, and he did it. And when he basically says, I want to be a little bit past neutral. And this was big, too, actually, because you go back to Janet Yellen. When she stopped using the word normalization, that was the most misused, misappropriated word in history of you know, financial markets and monetary policy. Normalization. Normal is what it is now. There's nothing else normal about you know, where we might go that would be normal. When they, they started using the term neutral, everything changed. And that was the point where you said, look, inflation is actually at the point was 2% or even a little higher. Okay, So for them to go to 2% on policy would be, make sense, they would be neutral. All right, so you had a massive move in the bond markets. The two-year note went from 140 to like 285. And I mean, we call that move because they called this move. But then you get to the point now where you're approaching 2%, you get to 2% on policy, and all of a sudden inflation shows you signs of rolling over. And that's when we wrote the piece that we last did on Real Vision, and we said, a bridge too far, that the Fed would take this one step too far. And they did in December. By going to 25 on the top end of the range, 240 has been the, pretty much the effective rate this entire time. Uh, inflation now all of a sudden drops below 2 and the Fed downgrades their own forecast for future inflation to below two? Well, this is the problem. No longer are they just a little above neutral. Now they are outright tight. And that was a problem. And it was a problem specifically for the consumer. One of the things that happened because of that last rate hike is you pushed the monthly amount of money that consumers have to pay to float their debt to a record high, $348 billion a month. And this is now closing in on a $500 billion a month total retail sales in the U.S. You knew at some point this math doesn't work, and it doesn't allow for growth in cons consumer discretionary spending. So what happened in the first quarter? Discretionary spending fell off the face of the planet. And I mean, you had the worst two-month back-to-back decline in non-store retailers in history. You had a big decline in what had been very strong, and the primary beneficiary of tax cut relief was eating and drinking establishment spending. That growth virtually disappeared. And all of a sudden, gee, are we shocked that Jerome Powell is doing a little double take and starting to backpedal a little? No, it wasn't a surprise. But we also said all the way back in August in one of our Real Vision appearances that this would take several steps. The Fed was going to have to go too far first. Then they were going to have to go to neutral and then reverse to what they just did, which create a bias towards ease. They haven't even cut rates yet. The problem is that the, the, the Treasury market and the Fed funds futures is pricing in four rate cuts by 2021. And the Fed's dot plot is completely different. 
Yeah, the Fed moved towards a bias to ease. Yes, the Fed lightened up a little bit here with their projections and their dot plot. But their dot plot still implies one and done. They're going to cut rates once, and that's it. Next year, unchanged. And 2021, they're back to hiking rates again. Something's got to give in here. Stock market rallies built upon the fixed income market view that the Fed's going to cut four times. The dollar is not. So you have a lot of cross currents here that is really interesting. And this uncertainty alone generates demand for gold and is one of the reasons why I think gold has delinked from the dollar and is not you know, moving lower as the dollar moves higher here. So, man, there's a lot going on. Those are great, you know, great questions and great thought processes for us to talk about. Uh, and it's only going to get more interesting as we go forward because you have a timeline laid out in the Fed Funds futures market, which if not met by the Fed, could be problematic. That's the $64 million question because you have a variety, and I just did a special on this, actually called it when, when, the, when the music plays the band, okay, and I'm an old Grateful Dead guy, I love EDM music, so I mean, I, I cover the spectrum of music, just I love music. And if you remember the old Grateful Dead, you know, one of the tunes was, you know, the music never stopped, and one of the lines is, when the music plays the band. That's what's happening here. The music is the fixed income market. The music is all the markets. The music is the macro situation. The band is the Fed. The Fed is not playing the music right now. The music is playing the band. And we're going to see whether the band catches up. You said one of the questions before, is the Fed kind of falling behind the curve here? According to the fixed income market, yes, they are. And fairly dramatically so, for sure. Now, does it take a reconciliation of all this in the stock market to bring the Fed into play? Well, it's hard to make that case when stocks are breaking out to new highs predicated upon a thought process that the Fed's going to cut rate four times. When the Fed's not suggesting they're even close to you know, doing that. A lot of people, we're here, you know, July 12th it is today. A lot of people think it's a, you know, it's a given the Fed's going to cut rates in July. That's not priced into the Fed funds market. It's just not. You know, it's not priced until September. So maybe you have this melt-up scenario in the stock market between now and September, and then you set yourself up for like fall shenanigans and October disappointment that the Fed is not acting as fast as the market fixed income market has kind of laid out as a timeline, stocks get whacked, and that's the catalyst to make the Fed more aggressive. I don't know how that plays out. And then if they are more aggressive, at what point does the long end start to be concerned about that? We're not seeing that yet either. So uh, I think that's something that could come down the road. But for right now, you know, fixed income is just going to stand pat with their, with their stance that the Fed's going to cut rates. And you could almost say that if the Fed doesn't meet the timeline, and you start to see some economic numbers that are not so hot, that fixed income market could rally even more. If you look at the long-term pattern over the last four decades in the 30-year T-bond, all right, you have a tendency, a very tight correlation, very tight pattern, I should say, with the 30-year making new yield lows and then rallying back up to the four-decade long trend line, which times right in with the 10-year exponential moving average on a monthly chart. It's uncanny how many times you've come up and touched the 10-year moving average. And every time you do that, you make new lower lows. You just did it, and it pro you know, projects a sub-2% 30-year bond yield. And that'll be interesting to see how it plays out, because you know dang well, if you get any kind of economic news and the Fed is not quick enough, at least on the verbal rhetoric easing, uh, that could be a problem for the stock market, which would drive bonds into a feeding frenzy. So... The question is a really good one. I don't know the answer to that. I think you have probably more bullishness and then potentially some, you know, some uh, heartburn off of that bullishness. And that particularly applies in Europe. If, this, if the European Central Bank goes to any kind of two-tier system where they're trying to funnel money to consumers and businesses through some kind of you know, subsidized loan program, I mean, bond yields in Europe could really jump. And uh, then, of course, that could bring back into play what? Something else everyone's forgotten about sovereign debt issues. So let's not even talk about that in the US. But long answer short on bonds, you know, it's a tough one to call. I'm not sure. I do kind of feel like it's more bullishness before some bearishness. In terms of the commodities, I mean, these are probably the most interesting markets right now and maybe the most bifurcated. What you have in base metals are markets that have, in a lot of cases, like tin and zinc in particular, very low levels of inventories. You've had big declines in zinc. It was kind of, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, produced by the producers, you know, it was kind of orchestrated by the producers who cut production. It was almost like an OPEC cartel type of thing in zinc. Tin, big demand, new kinds of tech demand too. It's kind of a longer term secular bull demand side for some of these metals uh, with very low inventories. And yet these markets are on the verge of major breakdowns technically. The swaps, which have been in bullish backwardation in tin and in zinc in particular, and even at certain points in copper, have, are on the verge of moving back into a bearish contango. And what this is telling us is that the base metals are more concerned about the future demand side and the, maybe the Fed doesn't act quick enough and the dollar's still pretty high and all these things could crimp demand down the road versus the supply side, which is actually pretty tight in some of these metals. That's a real tell. And we'll see how that plays out because if they don't break and they find some footing, that would be interesting in terms of the play along with gold and other things that the dollar kind of ultimately has its day of destiny to the downside. When you look at some of the other commodities markets, I find some real interesting opportunities that are kind of you know, autonomous to everything we're talking about and yet would benefit dramatically if kind of what we think is going to happen happens. And those are some of the grains, oil seeds really in particular, soybeans. Uh, and some of the soft tropical commodities like coffee, like sugar, like cocoa. So I think there are some real opportunities in those markets, kind of a case by case basis. You maybe have heard some of the stories around what's happening in the U.S. with the crop in terms of soybeans. I mean, a lot of the crops not even planted. People are saying the U.S. data numbers in terms of crop progress uh, were fudged at the end because they didn't want a nightmare scenario here where prices are spiking. A lot of the late planting is what they call prevent planting, where farmers are trying to ensure that they get their insurance payments on a crop that they're never going to bring to market. And in the case of soybeans, it's interesting to note how when you had big crops the last two years, been pretty much a bumper crop in the U.S., that's the headlines. It's all a supply side issue most of the time in the oil, seed, and grain markets. And you've had huge crops. But what people tend to forget is that the demand side, particularly in soybeans, hits a record every year. Consumption is through the roof. Growth might slow a little bit with some of the animal issues you have in China, the biggest consumption dynamic of all, but it is still growth. The point here is there's no margin for error in some of these markets. Sugar is another really good example. And if you have any kind of disruptions to the supply side, it's potentially very bullish. And you have that case in soybeans, and I think it's being played down right now. And even to the degree a late planted crop makes you more susceptible to yield issues down the road, particularly if you get a flip in the weather and you have a, you know, a second half of August that's really hot and dry, soybeans could just be in a really bullish situation. And I think the market is underestimating the bullishness of that potential, uh, particularly in that you know, uh, one market. In terms of emerging markets, I mean, it really kind of is all over the map, depending on where you're looking at. Uh, as it relates to China, the one thing I'm, you know, almost immediately point out is a twofold thought process. Number one, the PBOC has a ton of room to cut interest rates. Bond yields there are still actually pretty high. The short end, you know, was, you know, above 4% for a while, with inflation low and falling for all intents and purposes. The long end, you have even more VIG. They really haven't addressed any of this through cutting rates. They've been holding off on cutting rates. I think it's almost like until we see the whites of their eyes type of thing. They've used reserve requirements pretty aggressively. They've done some things on the back end regulatory wise with lending, particularly in the rural areas uh, that have been somewhat effective. And of course, you know, the first thing you think about is, oh, it's a credit bubble. And of course it is. But it's a credit bubble that I think could get blown up a lot more. And particularly given the flexibility the PBOC currently has with monetary policy. Number two thought would be if there's a resolution to this trade situation, it's a heck of a lot more bullish for China than it is for the US. And China has severely underperformed. So I think if there's opportunities potentially out there, and if there are surprises, it would tend to be more bullish and more bullish potentially for China in terms of equities, number one. And then the other thought process I would throw in here Okay, just food for thought. It's kind of, you know, one of the things we like to, when I worked at More Capital, one of the things we used to love to do was just sit around and what if scenarios, you know, let's get crazy. What if this? What if this? And kind of this way, if something starts to happen, you've almost thought about it, envisioned it a little bit. You almost have a kind of a clue as to you think you might know what you want to do. One of those what if scenarios that's in my head, since China walked away from the trade negotiations, the timeliness of that walk was eye-opening. 
And what happened in the wake of that, no one's really talking about. And that is the Renimbi, which had been strengthening into these, you know, potential resolution and agreement, negotiation comes to an agreement, okay? The renimbi has been strengthening, okay? They don't want that. They want to work their currency lower. It's sitting around, you know, dollar, dollar renminbi is just below seven. Uh, you're looking at technical levels that if you take out, you know, the 698 level, you're going to seven and a quarter. So the second they walked away, the renminbi comes under big pressure. You had the largest 52-week rate of appreciation, of rally in the Rimnimbi, right at the height of this dynamic where they walked away, that you've had since the 1990s, okay? And that is now dissipating very quickly. So that strength in their currency is dissipating. You have the potential for some depreciation in the currency when no one's pointing fingers at them saying, look at your currency depreciating. Why? Because it's an offshoot of them walking away from the trade deal. They get some depreciation to the, to the currency. Now they feel a little more comfortable to come to the table and make a deal. So I'm not so sure that there was really anything around, you know, we don't want to make a deal is why they didn't make a deal and walked away and maybe reneged on some of the things they said. I think it was more about the timing in the markets. We know they're very astute when it comes to being traders. I've been following the Chinese for 30 years, man. They really often really know what they're doing. And this is the first thing I thought of when they walked away. It's like, then the currency gets hit and no one says a word. I found that to be almost too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. But to round back to the question, emerging markets are tough case by case basis. I think there's a lot of areas where you need to watch for problems in emerging markets. Places you might not even necessarily think about, like Angola. It's a major, you know, sub-Saharan African economy, relatively speaking. Right now, they're pumping more oil than is Nigeria. If the Nairo is having an issue, people would know about it. They'd be talking about it. Okay, the Kwanzaa, the currency of Angola, a major OPEC, major oil producer, so on and so forth. Okay, I mean, the Kwanzaa is just getting wasted and has been for a while now. And gold, in terms of Kwanzaa, not only is it a record high, it's up 500% in the last 10 years. So you have places like Pakistan, like I mentioned before, even Iran. I mean, the real gets whacked. Gold and real is making new highs, you know, in the Iranian currency. You have the situation in some of the former Soviet republics, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan, where two of them, Uzbekistan, also the Somme in Uzbekistan. And then you look at places like Uruguay and Colombia and, you know, even Argentina, let alone what's going on in Venezuela. And I think there are a lot of landmines still lurking out there. And at the end of the day, kind of this goes back to a dynamic of if you can't use the local currency locally, you know, as a means of exchange for goods and services, that's a problem. And that may be one of the reasons why the dollar hasn't come off in the way you might think it would under a scenario where the fixed income market's pricing in four rate cuts from the Fed. To me, the dollar would have been much lower if not for some of these other things that not a lot of people talk about all the time. It's, you know, it's not sexy, it sounds quirky, and it's kind of like, who cares? Well, you know, my motto is and always has been, everything matters. These things, to me, are tells. And when I see what's going on with the currency market and I see what's going on with gold, it all ties back to the same end game here, too. Just a growing general fraying around the edges when it comes to any paper, whether it be currency or bond, and how this plays into... You know, do you want to own Bitcoin or do you want to own gold? And in terms of Bitcoin versus gold, I'll say simply, you know, we actually got bullish on Bitcoin not too long ago and kind of riding this latest wave. I could see money moving into Bitcoin. But, you know, the idea behind holding gold over everything else is for kind of a doomsday scenario. And you get a, you know, you get a coronal mass ejection that knocks out the power grid. Your Bitcoin is worthless and useless, whereas your silver bars and gold bars are still worth something. Could 2019, 2020 be the global credit crisis, you know, the denouement of all of this? It could be. It really could be. I think there's a lot of bullets still left, you know, for central banks, given that the Fed has created room for themselves, given that they're actually appearing to be hawkish. Well, maybe, maybe in the back rooms, they're not so hawkish, you know. The Fed has been masterful at puppeteering the markets the way they want to ever since Taper went to tap out in August of 2014. They have done an unbelievable job of, you know, pulling the strings. I mean, at one point they were they were projecting a 375 Fed funds rate by 2017. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, so I think there's firepower there. 
the dollar is always the relief valve. So, you know, if that comes into play, that could be pretty powerful too. What the ECB might pull in terms of a rabbit out of the hat here could be very powerful as well. At the end of the day, though, this is a situation which could implode in any given moment. You just don't know. There's more and more landmines. The, the, the field that investors are walking through gets more treacherous every single day. So to think that we can keep walking this, papering over these problems without, you know, uh, no disrespect to our, you know, to God bless our troops. But I mean, you know, you step on a landmine, blow a leg off at any given moment. It's very dangerous out there in terms of all the potential problems that could precipitate a global debt crisis. And one of the things to really watch is the dollar. I mean, straight up, uh, to me, it's kind of why the dollar hasn't declined. You have these issues in so many other countries where literally the local currency is completely out of favor. I mean, that, and you have, a, you know, I mean, how much dollar debt do you have now? It's exponentially grown along with consumer credit and so on and so forth. There's always the risk of a global credit crisis, no doubt. I think that that will not necessarily just implode on the scene, but will evolve and I think we'll have more and more signs to, to read before we get to that point. But again, having said that, it could happen tomorrow. And that's kind of what makes it so both you know, scary and yet exciting to get up every day and do what we do. Well, MMT is getting a lot of play. Uh, I've actually kind of been in the circles, so to speak, not necessarily an inside guy. But Warren Mosler is kind of one of the first guys to talk about this. And... I uh, had my office in St. Croix for a number of years, and Warren had his office in St. Croix, and we became friendly, and I hung out with him quite a bit. Actually, when I was in St. Croix, Scott Ramsey of Denali Capital, another kind of big player in this whole kind of situation developed around, you know, people moving their businesses down to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, so I know Warren well, highly respected. I mean, just a super intelligent guy. And this is something I've heard about for, you know, 12, 12 15 years. Uh, it's new on a lot of people. But it's an interesting thought process to the point where, you know, as I'm, you know, getting to know Warren, really not related to him, I wrote in my book in 2006, I called it Monetary Armageddon. And what this is, is like you see in the Hollywood movies where, you know, they're fighting aliens and the last resort is to, you know, shoot off all the nukes and you have to have, you know, two people that have the keys and they have to, you know, put, it, put the key in and press the button simultaneously. Well, monetary Armageddon is a very real thing where the Fed and the Treasury could be those two people turning the keys and in one fell swoop, one keystroke, wipe out all of the Treasury debt ever printed and sold. Uh, that seems outrageous. But given the evolution in the last 10 years, it's not as outrageous as it once was. And it's kind of like, who cares? Who cares what a debt to GDP ratio is? I mean, if you kind of look back at what happened when you had Maastricht and the European Union Treaty, I mean, they picked 60% as a level above which you'd be penalized if you had sovereign debt to GDP ratio above 60%. I mean, when you come right down to it, the 60% Maastricht rule on you know, sovereign debt to GDP ratio was a, was a randomly chosen number. No backdrop, no scientific studies, no math, no academics, you know, with five different studies published that's going to tell us what is the optimum level to penalize someone. We got a lot of studies on what level of crisis would occur if you're above 100 and heading higher. Italy's in that zone. Um, but I think in terms of MMT, it's going to get more play. It's going to become more popular. There's a very credible thought process behind it. Um, you know, I, when I kind of have this discussion, you know, part of the reason it's gaining traction and credibility is because they've printed so much money and they have, you know, monetized so much sovereign debt. And now there is so much more sovereign debt. And yet you have no real inflation, so to speak of inflation, that they'll kind of keep doing it until they get inflation. If you, you know, basically pushed a button and vaporized every bond ever sold by every government in the world, would you get inflation? I have to say that's the day you want to own gold because maybe a loaf of bread is going to cost you 25 bucks. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's something that will gain traction in terms of ideas. You'll see it implemented more and more. And that bottom line is a base case uptrend left to right on the screen, as they say, in gold.
welcome to the end of the video. We know that on average, 85% of you who start a video on Real Vision finish it. That's extraordinary. On Facebook, it would just be 4%. And that's because Real Vision creates the most engaging content in the entire media world. Let us help you grow your business by making video content that really engages your customers. Email us at customvideo at realvision.com.